Hey guys, how's it going? Hello there. Look, feeling a little blurry today. Yeah, hold on, let me adjust the focus on my glasses here. Uh, technology these days, they try to help us out with autofocus and it always messes things up. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, looks a little different today. We're, we're missing someone. Uh, Steve, uh, lucky guy as he is, he's in Europe right now doing the international launch and support trainings for the max measurement system over there. So with me today, and a little bit out of focus, we have uh, Matt Mergenthal, my partner in crime on the training team, and Hi, our everybody. tech support director, Carlos Chavez, who will be the muscle today to help move around some subwoofers and microphones and all of that fun stuff. So um, this is a pretty cool training today. Matt's done a, a nice job of putting together um, a session that's going to build off of what we did last week. So last week, Matt and Steve um, showed us how to properly integrate a home audio subwoofer to an existing system using our TuneFor software with a single microphone. So we could look at RTA measurements, um, look at using RTA to essentially improve the summation uh, of our subwoofer and our main speakers in a two channel or stereo um, audio system. So what we're gonna do today is build off of that with our max measurement system, take advantage of that multi-mic array and a bunch of other cool features that Matt and Carlos uh, will uh, get uh, share with us. So. Um, are you guys ready? We are ready. We're right, ready. Well, actually, camera's not. Let me see. start, though. One quick disclaimer. Apparently, the boys there in South Florida are in the midst of the wonderful mid-afternoon Florida weather, which means 50-mile-per-hour winds and some pretty ridiculous hail. So hopefully the power in the building uh, keeps up. And uh, if they do uh, disappear on us, uh, it's related to that, and we'll figure something out at that point. So... Um, I'll bring up Matt's keynote here, and I guess it's, uh, let's take it away, guys. Perfect. All right. Hopefully, at some point, we'll become a little less blurry. But, yeah. uh, all right. So today, we're working on home subwoofer integration with the MAX measurement system. Uh, as, as Rob said, this is a really cool training because this is the first time that we're doing anything like this with multiple microphones and setting up a room. Um, so looks like Rob's got the room view up there, and we'll get to that momentarily, but I'm going to go ahead and start uh, on the keynote here. So today's agenda, it's uh, if you've been keeping up with our previous trainings, it's uh, similar to some of the things we've covered before, slightly different, but we're going to cover some of the same uh, material. So uh, just stick, stick with us and you'll get to the cool stuff uh, throughout the presentation here. So uh, our goal today is to measure the room to find the optimal subwoofer location. Um, and sometimes uh, we can do that with either moving a subwoofer or moving a microphone. Um, then we're going to talk about connecting max measurement system to tune and uh, we'll measure multiple locations at the same time with multiple microphones. Uh, we'll talk about aligning the frequency response to a given target that we choose. Uh, and then we'll do some phase alignment of the subwoofer to the main speakers and then we're going to listen and document the results when we're finished. So and there is going to be some new stuff that we may be discussing today, um, especially for our home audio dealers or enthusiasts that haven't watched some of our mobile related trainings on Tune 4 and Max. So throughout the training, when Matt starts talking about some of the items like maybe our targets mode in Tune 4 software, I'll be posting some links in the chat as well to our help center articles and YouTube videos that will dig deeper into some of those uh, areas or categories if this isn't something you're totally familiar with or been joining us for the last six, seven months we've been doing these sessions. Absolutely. All right. So um, first thing, we'll talk about the crawl test, right? So some people may be familiar with this. People have uh, been in home audio situations before. And the crawl test is basically you play some heavy bass music like bass mechanic or something that you're familiar with. And you basically put the subwoofer in the listening position, and then you crawl around the room. And what I mean by put the subwoofer in the listening position is when you have a microphone in the listening position and you have the subwoofer somewhere in the room that you desire, it's a reciprocate, reciprocating effect. So if you take mm -hmm. the subwoofer and place it into the listening chair, and then you take your microphone, you move it around the room, you'll get the same effect on the, on the microphone that you would have if you flipped positions. So basically we take the subwoofer, sit it in the listening chair and then crawl around the room and listen to bass music and find out in the room where the best sounding spot is, right? And uh, very scientific, you know, repeatable process. So, 
after that, we kind of got into the SPL measurements with music. So we'd play bass mechanic again, and we'd take an SPL meter and look at the meter and say, okay, what's the loudest place in the room when the music's playing? And that's a little difficult because music's very dynamic. So the reading would be jumping around a lot while you're doing that. Um, then we got into SPL measurements with a single frequency or single tone. Uh, so we would typically play it maybe a 50 hertz sine wave and we'd take the microphone, put it around the room and, and find the uh, highest volt, the highest value for that single position and frequency. Now there's some flaws to that because the single position only represents that one frequency. So if you're talking about 50 hertz, that may not represent the same as maybe 60 hertz does or 70 hertz. So um, then we went to SPL measurements with multiple tones, right? So we'd play 30 hertz, 40 hertz, 50 hertz, 60 hertz, and document all of those results. And then we'd come back and try and find a, a position based on the values of each frequency and hopefully find a good position. And that works too, but it's a little archaic and, and not maybe the best option. So then we went to the RTA measurement. And in our previous trainings, we've discussed this where you can take an RTA measurement with tune four and a single microphone, and you can move it around the room and get great results. So you can see all frequencies that the subwoofer is playing, and that's really good to use. Today, we're gonna to take it even one step further, and we're gonna talk about using multiple microphone positions with uh, RTA and max, max uh, measurement system. So um, let's get into that. I'm so actually excited to see how, what we, with using Max and that extra insight it provides, what kind of gains we're going to see. Because if you remember last time, when we had just the single mic RTA, just looking at the frequency response in that summation range and with the RTA and finding the right placement, I think we were able to gain about 7 dB, if I remember, around 80 to 100 hertz. So yeah, very substantial. So I'm excited with Max, what it's going to be today. <laughs> yep, yep. So it's it's definitely cool. Uh, so taking measurements in general, we're going to, we have to determine a reference and how we determine a reference is we take the uh, first measurement microphone, we get it close to the subwoofer and we basically take the room acoustics out of the equation because we place the microphone close enough to the subwoofer that we don't see the effects of the room. So that becomes our reference. So we know what the subwoofer is capable of doing compared to what the room is changing. Okay, so then we're going to look at the frequency response and the broadband energy level. We're going to measure locations in the room that make sense. Um, some positions in the room, like in the center of the room, right where your, your coffee table might go, might not be a good position to put it. So um, we have to consider where we can put the subwoofer. Um, we're going to normalize all of the inputs so that this they're all about the same level, and we can look at uh, nulls and peaks in the response. And, choose one based on what has the smoothest and overall best output response available. Um, and then we're going to compare the traces for the most desirable response. And we're going to look at DARO if you have that. So if you have a Fathom or Gotham and you have the digital automatic room optimization, that will actually take peaks out of the response. So if you have a position in the room that has a lot of high peaks, DARO can help with that by removing those peaks and making it more flat. Um, so that's a very helpful tool if you have a Fathom or a Gotham to take advantage of. Yeah. And if you download Tune4 software and have either a USB microphone or the max measurement system, you can even measure and capture the room before and after the DARO runs to see how it smoothed out your subwoofer's response. That's right. And if at any, any point throughout this presentation I talk too fast or I miss something and somebody wants to jump in the comments and you know ask us to clarify something, please do. Um, normally Steve's here to slow me down. So I'm relying on Rob and Carlos to take care of that for me today. So then we're going to talk about using targets and we didn't get into too much of this on the, the single microphone session, but since you're using Max, if you, if you're watching this session and you know, you have a Max and you're going to utilize this, then you're probably pretty familiar with using targets and we'll go through the software and, you know, kind of show you what, how to choose the proper crossover. Uh, target and then where to load it from and how to save it and modify it. Um, so targets do show the optimal alignment electrically. Um, 80 hertz electrical filter doesn't always equate to an 80 hertz acoustical filter. Mm -hmm. So what that means is if you have an 80 hertz slope 
uh, electrically that you may need 70 or 90, depending on the result on the acoustic side where you have the microphones measuring the speaker that may have to change up or down slightly. So we'll look at those results real time and we'll determine what makes sense to, to do there. So we'll go over choosing a proper target, choosing the proper crossover, and then we'll match the subwoofer and the satellite speakers to the target. So um, then right after that, we're going to get into aligning phase. And now with Max, we can look at mm -hmm. phase. We can see it in real time, make changes and watch phase move as we make changes to the, the subwoofer or to the, uh, the processor that we have here. Um, analyzing phase is going to get you better results faster. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, the controls may be limited. Uh, what we'll have here today is a polarity control, which controls direction. So inward or outward, uh, and then the phase control, which will actually adjust the position of the phase trace. And we'll show you all that in real time. It'll make more sense when we get there. And then the last step is to listen. And um, unfortunately, you guys can't be here to, you know, <laughs> listen to it when it's all done. But uh, we'll do it for you. And the uh, the subwoofer and speaker should sort of disappear altogether, and, and they should be working together as a system. So what you should be hearing when it's all done is really good sounding music, not speakers in the subwoofer. Uh, so you should expect to hear good imaging between the two speakers. And what I mean by imaging is with stereo signal, you have left and right. And when they're dialed in properly, what you would get is a left, a phantom center image, and a right. And what I mean by phantom center image is it would sound like there's an invisible speaker right in the center. So any common information that's between left and right will present in the middle. Um, and then we're going to spend some time listening to it and uh, make sure if this is a customer's uh, house, you would make sure they're happy with it. And uh, if we make changes to the uh, system after we listen, make sure we remeasure and document those changes because if we find that there's a system we really are happy with and it really sounds good, you can save that trace and then create your target based on that. So every time you uh, go through the process, you can use that as your target and get to your desired end result faster. Yep. So um, at this point, I think we're gonna uh, jump into the room view, Rob, and discuss what the system is and then Absolutely. we'll bring up so uh, what we have here today is we have um, a set of B&W, uh, Bowers and Wilkins, uh, 802 D3s, uh, and we have a, <clears throat> a pair of E-subs that are uh, next to the, the B&Ws there. Uh, these are 12-inch E-sub models, and we have a CR1 uh, electronic crossover that sends signal to these devices. Um, in the listening position, we actually have a Dominion D110 subwoofer, which uh, we're using just for testing. And uh, we'll uh, end up using the E-subs as our actual measurement speakers. So what we're going to do here first is we're going to go ahead and get tune up on the screen. So, all right, I got tune up here. Perfect. Well, um, Carlos is actually going to go over and turn on our max measurement system. And this process is kind of uh, complicated, hooking it up to tune. Um, it may be somewhat difficult if this is your first time. He just plugged in the USB and it says, JL Audio Max detected. Please refresh the device list to allow for max hardware to be selected. So I'm just going to click OK. And look Whoa. at it. Man, that was tough. Was it that, that easy? <laughs> so uh, if you've seen our, our single mic session, we showed where you have to go in and actually set up the single microphone. With Max, once you plug it in to your computer, it automatically configures with Tune software and it's ready to measure as soon as you plug it in. So we try to make it as quick as possible to get right into the measurements. Um, so what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to start by talking about targets and we're going to pull up a target on screen that would be a desired target to use. So if we go over to the right hand bottom side of the graph, there's a little target panel and there's a load and a save button. So we can load a target based on uh, the system that we have. So the system we have, again, it's, it's a pair of main speakers that have a woofer, a mid range and a tweeter, but those are all passively crossed over within the speaker itself. So we can't control the mid-range or the tweeter at all. We can only control the single signal that's going into the speaker. 
Um, so we have that speaker and then we have two subwoofers. So this would be considered a two way system, uh, an active woofer and an active speaker. So we're going to go ahead and load a two way target. So the JL Audio two-way target, this comes uh, pre-installed in Tune 4 software when you download it. And it's going to say that the current target settings will be overwritten. That's okay. And uh, what we have on screen here, we have two different windows. So we have the meters and gains in the top. And what this shows is the max inputs and outputs. So when you look across the top, you see the high-level input one and two. You see your five microphone inputs your analog reference input, and then your outputs, your digital outputs and inputs as well. Um, on the bottom graph here, we have the RTA. And if you're not familiar with this, along the bottom of the RTA, the x-axis represents frequency, how often something happens. And the y-axis represents amplitude, how loud something is. All right, so um, I'm going to just change one quick setting here uh, on max to the default settings. So with the default max settings, what you would see is the multi-mic input. Um, and that's what we're going to look at uh, later on. But first, what we're, we're going to do is we're going to turn that setting off. What we want to see is the five individual mic inputs one at a time, uh, because we have five different mic positions in the room. And uh, basically, we have uh, a position next to each subwoofer in the front of the room. We have a position in the very front corner of the room. And we have another position under the table. Um, so in a house, you may have a, a bench behind the table uh, where you could put a subwoofer. You could put it over in the front corner of the room or you could put it next to the main speakers. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at four of these microphones at the same time and see what makes sense to choose. So the microphones are already set up in position here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play signal and up in the top right corner, you'll see the signal generator and the default setting is ping periodic noise. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit play on my signal generator. And you'll see that Max is now sending signal out of these uh, outputs here. So the digital left and right and the RCA left and right outputs. So it's sending signal out to the subwoofer that's in the listening position, which is that Dominion uh, single 10 inch woofer. Um, and we see that there's signal coming in on the five mic inputs now. So what we need to do is we need to pull up these five mic inputs on the RTA, which you can do right down here. So on the RTA graph, there's a little input combo box, what we call it. And it's, uh, it says mains right now. And the reason it says mains is because the red line here, part of our target, that's our main speakers, that is currently selected on the front of the graph. The purple target is the subwoofer target, and the yellow is the sum target. Okay, so if I select on this drop down where it says mains, I can now see all the inputs on max. So I can select any of these inputs to play on the RTA. So I'm going to go ahead and play all five of these inputs, the mic one through five. And uh, right now the signals are low, so I'm going to actually load a saved setup so that it brings up the microphones. So now my microphones are up on the screen. Um, so at this point, we're going to zoom in on the region that we want to look at, which is between 20 hertz and probably about 200 hertz is about where your subwoofer would play. So if I look on the right hand side of the graph here, there's some controls. There's the scale controls and the zoom controls. If I select the zoom, I can zoom in on a certain spot on the graph like that, or I can right click on this and set up scale and do 20 Hertz to 200 Hertz. And I can change the range of the Y axis and I can change how many steps per division. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're just going to zoom in a little bit on this using the plus arrow on the keyboard. The, the plus and minus icons, they will zoom the y-axis of the graph. So at this point, I'm just going to hide the targets temporarily. And on the right-hand side under the target panel, I can just select hide targets. And the goal here is to make all of these target these, these traces, the mic inputs, overlay the reference trace. And our reference trace here is the red one. 
And we know that the reference is the red one because the red one's always the center. That's what we choose as the reference microphone for uh, Max. So you could change that, but that's our default. So, so each colored trace represents the colored microphone or the, the colored microphone slash colored input of Max that it's plugged into. Correct. So on the right hand side of the screen, you can see light blue is mic one, light green is mic two, red is mic three, gray is mic four, and yellow is mic five. Yep. So what we want to do is we want to raise the values of these inputs until they match the red. And how can we do that? If we select uh, the mic three on here on the meter meters and gains tab, you can see that this uh, DBSPL value came up in the uh, information display. So what we want to do is we want to match everything to 91.7. So if I go on to the uh, little input combo box again, and I select mic one, I just need to raise this until it's at 91.7. So we'll do that with each trace. Now what Matt's doing here is changing the offset, correct? We're not actually changing the level. Uh, we're not changing the level. We're just offsetting the trace. So we're essentially moving the trace where we want it to without actually impacting the measurement on the RTA pane there. Correct. So we're not changing the measurement. And we can capture these measurements. It would be a good idea to capture these measurements so that we have them for later. So we can do that after we move them, and we can always move them back as well. So bring this up until it's at 91.7. All right, so now all of the traces are at 91.7 dB SPL, right? So now we can go through the process of elimination and determine which traces are not ideal, right? So mic five is the, uh, the yellow one. That, one, that one's the, the current front trace on the graph. And you can tell because it says mic five selected here in the corner that's the selected uh trace if and I these mics to... are in places where we could potentially put a subwoofer right so uh like i was saying before we have the two in the front of the room where the the uh, e subs are currently at and then we have one in the very front corner of the room all the way off to the right and the last one is under the table in the back of the room as in the excellent the right Mic five is the, the right one next to the subwoofer? Yeah. Okay. So we can see that there's a pretty big null in this yellow trace here. So I think that one and the green one should probably be the first two to go. Yeah, for sure. And that looks like right in the meat and potatoes too. What is that? About 50 to 70 hertz those nulls fall? Yeah, so that's 56 hertz. And the green one is at 62 hertz. Cool. So we're going to hide those temporarily. We're just going to hide them by selecting the little image icon that's there. And that leaves us with two positions here, which is the blue and the gray position. So in this room, uh, Carlos, what are the blue and the gray position? So blue is under the table, gray is right corner. Okay, so if you didn't hear that, the blue one is under the table and the gray position is in the front corner of the room. So what we just learned is that the positions in the front of the room may not have the best, most ideal frequency response. Now, sometimes uh, the designer or, or a person who's in charge of, of setting up the room may say, well, you're not putting a sub under the table or you're not putting one in the corner or it's a spousal approval factor may, may go down. But uh, in this situation, what we found is that we're not allowed to put a sub under the table and we're not allowed to put one in the corner. So what we're gonna do is we're going to proceed with the uh, one, the, the two positions that are in the front of the room, which is the green and the yellow. And um, we can see how that compares to the red, which is the reference. And the red's pretty smooth, pretty flat across, but the green and yellow have some big nulls around that 50 and 60 Hertz region. But in this application, there's, we have to use those positions. So we're just gonna move forward with those as, the, as, a, as if those are the only option. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna have, pause our, our signal for a second. And Carlos is going to go ahead and put all of the individual microphones back onto the uh, 
main microphone stand, which is in the listening position. So we're going to now look at a spatial average of the listening position uh, and see what the uh, the results are of that. So while Carlos is doing that, I'm going it, to if you haven't seen the Mac system before, it's a pretty, pretty cool setup, you know, on top of this nice travel case and the main, uh, uh, you know, the, the measurement system itself that comes with it. You, it has five really high quality microphones, uh, the mounts for them, a really nice array. So in this scenario here, as we can see, Matt and, Car uh, Matt and Carlos moving over there, Carlos has the array in the listening location. Thank you, Matt. You're Except welcome. now you're blocking Carlos and no one can see him. Sorry. <laughs> Noobs, what can you do? But what Carlos is doing is taking those five microphones that we had originally placed in individual locations and putting them back into that main array now so we can take a average of the listening area with those five microphones instead of five individual measurements like Matt had done prior. That's right. And I got a little microphone here. I can show the camera. Perfect. We'll so make you nice, nice and big so everyone nice can see. Nice audio microphone. It comes with the foam tip. Um, yep. Foam tips are for, for wind, so you don't necessarily have to use it in a car or in a house. But these are uh, wind breakers for the tips of the microphone. Yep. You can see the little colored clips on them as well, so you know what color input to plug into on the max measurement system. That's and right. as we saw, as we broke out the mics into individual RTA measurements, they were uh, colored to match the microphone and the input of the max measurement system as well to really make it easy to work with. That's right. So at this point, uh, I'm going to go back into our measure settings, which is up in the top left corner where you see these little three bars here. So I'm going to select the, the measure settings icon there, and I'm going to create a trace folder location for this specific session that we're doing. And uh, that'll allow you to save all your traces that you capture in the same folder so you can always reference them again. So we're going to choose here and we're going to select traces. And then I'm going to create a new folder and we're going to call this Manville's Room. Don't mess it up. <laughs> Especially for, for him. <laughs> All right, so now um, I'm going to go back into the measure settings one more time, and I'm going to select the measurement setup icon. And where I and this isn't available if you don't have Max plugged in. You'll see the tab there, but it's grayed out. In this application, the measurement setup tab, we can click on it because Max is connected. And if I click on the five microphone inputs, I can turn on hardware multiplexing again. And just to clarify what that is, hardware multiplexing is basically something that happens inside of Max where it rapidly switches between the active microphones and allows you to see an average of those five microphones. And it doesn't put any extra stress on the computer that you're using. Um, so that's why we, we have the hardware multiplexing. It works really well. But what we did today was we turned it off so we could look at the five individual mics. Now we're going to turn it back on so we see the spatial average of that headspace where the listener would sit. Yeah, the five mics is pretty cool. You know, instead of a single microphone, typically where it's going to be in the center of where you're sitting, but that's not where our ears are and that's not how our hearing works. So with that five mic array being wider, as Matt mentioned, you know, we've got this sphere now that we're getting an average and improving. So kind of as you move around, you're going to stay in that sweet spot instead of it being just dead center in the listening location. Absolutely. Um, so at this point, we're going to uh, pull up our targets again on screen. So I'm going to just select my show target icon and I'm going to select this button on the right hand side that says Re return graph to default scale, because right now we're still zoomed into that 20 to 200 range. So now that I select that, we can see the full range from 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. And the EQ overlay for the target is up. So I can just uh, hide that by pressing the E key. Um, and then what we see here is we see the three targets up on screen again. So what's going to happen now is we're going to play signal from our signal generator again, which is going to go into the CR1. And we're measuring the location from the, the listening position. So um, the subwoofers, we're going to end up unmuting them and we're going to capture their response with no crossovers, no phase changes, no polarity changes. They're going to be, everything will be turned off and we're going to see the raw data for those. So I'm going to go ahead and select play and we're going to measure these one at a time. So now we're, we should be, have the, uh, the 
left subwoofer? Is that what? Left what? Cool. All right. So now going back to our input combo box here, I can select my multi mic input, and we can scale the graph using the plus or minus keys just so we can get it up on screen a little bit. All right. Um, so what we're seeing here, we're seeing the overall uh, left subwoofer signal with no crossovers engage. And I'm going to go ahead and capture this. I'm going to stop talking for a second so it stops messing up my microphone. Bear with me. <laughs> left subwoofer. Okay, and uh, go ahead and do the right subwoofer, Carlos. All right, so there's our right subwoofer. Right subwoofer. All right. So, so to capture to capture the trace, what Matt's doing is pressing the space bar. But there's also on the bottom right of the RTA pane, there's a capture icon as well. And when you take a capture, it's not just taking a screenshot of, in this case, the RTA or the phase plot. When we look at phase later, it's an actual data capture. So when you reload one of these captures, we can actually change the, the uh, on the RTA, the banding. We can go from the lines to an, uh, a bar type of RTA. When we look at time-based measurement, same thing. If you took a capture for phase, that capture, since it's data, works with all time-based measurements. So we can load that trace uh, as a phase, as magnitude, as impulse or logarithmic IR. So it's, a, it's not just taking a screenshot. We're actually capturing data that we can further manipulate as needed uh, when we look at it with our uh, TuneForce software, which is pretty cool. Thank you for that, Rob. Um, so at this point, uh, we're going to unmute one of the main speakers, and that's going to be loud. So, Rob, if you would mute us. I will mute you right now. And so he's captured the one side, and now I'll be quiet while they unmute the other. All right. So it looks like we got left and right captures of our mains there, Matt. We do. So uh, I'm going to temporarily pause our microphone input. Um, so a couple things to dis discuss here. Um, our targets are slightly above the energy for the, the mains, the left and right, and the subwoofers. So we're going to realign these targets so that it overlays the main speakers a little better. Um, so if I on the level trims down here, you can see uh, at the bottom of the right hand of the screen, there's a little icon that will break out that window. So now with that broken out, we can select this linking icon and the linking icon will allow us to manipulate all of the traces at the same time. So I can move all of these down. And what we want is we want to have the, uh, the trace, the target sort of right in the center of that trace. So let me zoom in on this graph a little bit. And remember, this is the what we're essentially doing is like what we did earlier. We're offsetting the trace. So what we're doing is moving where the trace is laying on the RTA. So it lines up with our measurements. So we have a better idea of where the knolls truly are compared to the peaks and can make any appropriate changes as needed that way. Right. Um, so a couple other things I wanted to mention. So Rob sort of mentioned it up here at the top of the, the screen. Uh, this is called the contextual panel. And this panel changes based on which graph you select. So if I select the meters and gains, you'll see that the meters and gains uh, name shows up here in the contextual display and uh, contextual panel, I'm sorry. And it changes the options we have available. So. I'm going to select the RTA and you can see that these controls are for the RTA graph. So I can select different banding, which will show it will effectively average the data so it gets smoother. Um, you can go all the way down to single octave banding or you can go up to 148th octave banding. We'll probably stick right around 16th to 112th for today's session. Um, and then the averaging on the left hand side here what this controls is the uh, stability of the trace, how quickly the signal's refreshing. 
Um, so changing the, uh, the averaging, the amount of averaging applied will change how uh, stable the trace is as you're capturing data. Is it so, jumping uh, around or is it something that's rock solid? Right, exactly. Uh, I think for what we're going to do today, the, the default setting of 16 FIFO will be good. If yep, you do I'm, any sort of, uh, at least with our CARB products, our VXI, MVI amplifiers, where we have that cool auto set EQ feature, there you'll want something a little more stabilized, like an average of two seconds. But in this case, we're just taking measurements. We don't have any auto EQ controls uh, for what we're doing on the home side today. So that default 16 FIFO will work just fine. I agree 100%. Um, so now what we can look at is we can look at the uh, crossover region where the main speakers and the subwoofer are going to overlap. And uh, the target that we have set up here, the uh, filter point is at 80 hertz. So we have an 80 hertz electric crossover between the mains and the subwoofer. Um, so what we could do is we can start by um, applying changing the low pass on the subwoofer until it matches the red trace and then the high pass on the mains and i'm sorry the yeah, subwoofer has to match the purple trace the high pass for the mains will have to match the red trace so uh what, what we're going to do here is we're going to start with maybe the subwoofers and uh actually let's let's start with the mains carlos so because the, the mains uh they're likely going to be the limiting factor here um they don't have as smooth of a response down low as the subwoofers can provide. The subwoofers have a, a bit more control in that region. So let's uh, start with the mains and see how uh, close we can get it to that target. So uh, Rob, if you would. Yeah, I will meet you now. All right, so it looks like Matt using the. Oh. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Nope. Oh. So uh, using the CR1 there, you guys were able to adjust the uh, high pass filter response of That's the right. mains and line them up to the target. Yep. So what frequency did we end up at there? We ended up at about 70 hertz. 70 hertz. Okay. So 70 hertz high pass filter. And now we'll uh, play the other side and just confirm that it's about the same. We'll meet you one more time. All right. Those look pretty darn close. Couple minor deviations, but that should be expected in a large kind of unique room like what we have there. Right, so we're we're seeing that the the brown and the pink traces were what it was with no high pass filter applied, and then as we raised it to about seventy hertz, we got it right, right there to match up with that red trace. So I'm going to hide white, the old trace. White and yellow are pretty on pretty good on that trace there. Yep. So I'm going to hide the originals. So we're pretty close there, um, and there's a pretty large null right here at about. 105 uh, hertz there. It's uh, definitely because of the room. Uh, these speakers are pretty capable speakers. It's uh, definitely not the speakers. It's uh, this this room is far from ideal. The room modes in here are causing some issues, and uh, we're just going to work through it the best we can. We don't have any digital signal processing or anything to change what the speaker's uh, equalization looks like. So this is just how it's gotta, it's gotta stay for now. So now we're going to unmute the subs. So go ahead one time, Carlos. All right, so now we uh, play my multi-mic signal and go ahead and start lowering that uh, crossover, the high, uh, low pass filter there until, go ahead, keep going. Keep going, going. A little bit more. 
And right about there looks pretty good. That's cool. You can actually see how that subwoofer's knoll lines up perfectly with the knoll on the uh, mains. Uh, Tell Tell sign uh, it's a room issue. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't know if that's so much of a good thing, but yeah, that, unfortunately, they, the, the nulls do, do seem to line up. So we'll do our best to fix those. So left main speaker or left main uh, left subwoofer is this one, right? Um, and now at this point, if you had the DARO, now would be a good time to run it to compare how it removes the peaks to what, sig what your measurement was before. Um, we don't have DARO on these woofers that we're using, so we, we can't demonstrate that. But now would be an appropriate time to do that and confirm that the changes made are desirable and appropriate. So right. go ahead with the other side, please. So this is the right subwoofer. Right subwoofer. All right. Um, so now we have the four traces overlaid. They match the purple and red targets pretty well. So um, what we know is right now, the only thing we haven't done is we haven't looked at phase yet. Um, so now we're going to get into looking at phase and uh, see how we can get the interaction between the subwoofers and the main speakers to work. We want to get them to work together and not uh, fight each other. So um, what we're going to do is on this top graph here, I'm going to select the graph type combo box. And uh, first, I'm going to look at the impulse response. And the reason we have to look at the impulse response is because we need to figure out where in time uh, that we want Tune to look at. OK, so if I pull up, there's three different types of impulse response graphs, linear impulse response, uh, log logarithmic Im impulse response, and energy time curve. We're going to focus on the linear impulse response today or the log. Uh, both are good tools to use. So we'll start with linear. And uh, what we see here is the targets that are uh, turned on. We're just going to hide the targets temporarily. And if we uh, turn on our transfer function engine number three, and I'll get into a little bit about what that is, uh, a transfer function, if we go into the measure settings, here's our transfer function engines. And what this means is a dual channel FFT. So we have a measure signal, which comes from our center microphone, microphone number three. That's and why the measurement's measure. red as well. Yes, good point. And the uh, reference signal on the bottom is coming from our internal loopback. And what an internal loopback is, is basically just a piece of wire that goes from the outputs of Max back into the input of Max. And that's inside of Max, so you never have to hook that up. It's already there. So pretty uh, much the microphones are comparing coming from what the they're picking up to what Max is playing through the signal, or Tune 4 is playing through the signal generator in that loopback. So obviously any differences in time we'll be able to see, uh, any variances in the frequency response. If we use magnitude, we'd be able to see, because we're essentially comparing, I don't, what are we playing, uh, periodic pink noise? That's right, yep. Right, so as the reference signal, it should be a flat, full range signal. So anything that's different, any differences in time, any differences in uh, amplitude, the frequency response that the microphones are picking up, they're gonna compare themselves to that flat full range pink noise that we're playing as reference. That's right. All right, so what we're gonna do is um, we're going to look at the subwoofer's impulse response. And what we need to do is we need to set a reference so we tune knows where to look. And what I mean by that is we'll play the subwoofer and we'll find out where in time the arrival is. Okay, so if I scale the graph to the default scale using these scale controls on the right, you can see that it's difficult to see uh, any impulse response or any signal. Um, what you're seeing here on the graph, the x-axis represents time. So with zero being in the middle, anything showing up in the negatives would be showing up early. Anything showing up in the positives on the right would be showing up later. Okay, And uh, the y-axis represents amplitude as well. Um, so if I use this auto scale button on the right hand side, I can auto scale Y axis so I can see the data. And now we can see a signal showing up. And um, basically what we're seeing is where the subwoofer is arriving in time. And I don't necessarily care the exact number figure. I don't care about the number. All we need Tune to do is reference this time 
when it's looking at phase. And we'll get a little deeper into that, but I'm gonna set this time right here as my reference delay. My reference delay is in the contextual panel at the top of tune here. So this time you can see in the top right on the information display is 13.6 milliseconds. So if I just type in 13.6, now 13.6 is my new zero at the bottom of the graph. Okay, so now when we look at phase, it will make sense. And you have to have a baseline for phase to be compared to. Exactly. Phase is relative to something. And in this case, it's relative to 13.6. Yep. Um, now, what will happen is if we don't have a reference, if I put zero in this box instead, you see that the, the actual data changed. And it's there's, there's some more wraps there, some extra wraps that you're seeing. So the reference just allows us to see where in time we're comparing our speakers. Um, we just want to make sure that they're all about the same uh, as far as where they're arriving so we can read it on this graph. So now when looking at a phase graph, it's similar to the RTA in that the x-axis represents frequency response and the y-axis represents time. I don't necessarily care what time at 270, 300, 330, I, I don't care about that number. What I want to find out is if these traces are overlaid by the other speakers in my system. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start by, um, we, we, we know that we can't control the main speakers. We can only adjust the subwoofer because our only con controls here are the phase knob on the subwoofer and our polarity knob, knob on the subwoofer, the, the switch, I'm sorry. So Carlos, if you would actually start with the main speaker, we'll capture the main speaker first. And then we'll adjust the polarity and phase until we get them to overlay. So, uh, Rob, if you would. Yep. All right, can you hear us again? I got you. Cool. So what we're seeing here, I'm going to hide the red trace temporarily. What you're seeing is the white trace and the brown trace, which are our two main speakers. And uh, this graph may look very confusing. If you've never seen one before, it may not make a lot of sense. And I'm going to do my best to explain it in a way that does make sense. So. When looking at a phase graph, if a trace is going downwards and to the right, like this one here, that means that it's showing up later in time. If it starts going upwards and to the left, sort of, sort of like these ones over here, as we get around the uh, 1,000 hertz, they start going upwards. If it starts going upwards and starts looking goofy, that means that it's showing up early in time. And that's OK. We don't necessarily care about this data up here because we're not trying to compare this data to anything but itself. We want to compare the low frequency here around the crossover region to the subwoofer. So all that we're going to focus on is really from 20 hertz to 200 hertz. So I can zoom in on this so we can see it better. So we can get some of that other uh, stuff off of the screen so it's a little easier to see. And yeah, when we started um doing more work with phase on the training team as we were preparing for the max launch it really was the first time i had looked at live phase measurements and tried to figure out what adjustments you know i needed to make was it delay or all pass filters and it was a lot but once you kind of learn where to look it really makes it a lot easier so like as matt said if we're, we're focusing on the phase response between the subwoofer and the mains that's going to be where the crossover region is. So yeah, 60 to 200 Hertz, anywhere in that range where the, the, the interacting drivers could affect one another. That's what we care about. You know, yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on on the top end, but that's out of the, the, the band, the, uh, the pass band or the, uh, the area that we want to focus on with the subwoofer in the main. So once you kind of learn to, you know, focus on a specific area, it actually makes looking at phase a lot easier. And I'm sure there's some other tools that Matt will show you as well that can uh, help clean up the response as well. Sure. All right. So now that the phase is set up to, so we only see 20 hertz to 200 hertz, 
what we want to do is we want to compare the subwoofer to these. And we want the subwoofer and these to match. Um, and what I'm going to do to start, I'm going to adjust the smoothing. And the smoothing, what that uh, function does is it removes uh, reflective energy from the measurement. So if I change this from 1 12th smoothing to 1 6th smoothing, you can see that it cleaned up the graph a little bit, going to 1 3rd, makes it even easier to see. And that, that's probably a good thing. So we'll, let's keep it at 1 3rd for now. Uh, so it's a little easier to, to make out. And if I turn on our transfer function engine number three, this is our subwoofer, right? So now what we could see here is the white and brown trace, which is our main speakers, looks to be directly in between the red traces. You see it kind of splits the difference there. Yep. And um, so maybe something that we could try here would be flipping the polarity of the speaker. So if we flip it from zero to 180, effectively making it move the other direction, let's see where that gets us. Okay. Ooh, look at that. that. That's pretty close. It's not overlaying completely, but it, it's near it, right? It's closer than it was. So maybe, Carlos, we could try flipping that back and turn the phase knob and see if we can use the phase knob to line up those frequencies. All right, so he flipped the polarity back, and now he's adding, he's adjusting the phase knob. And what we really care about is the crossover region. Oh, uh, that, the, yeah, you're pretty close there. You're pretty close. So we're looking at like the 70 hertz region, uh, 70, 80, 90 hertz. So we're overlaying it pretty tightly here. Um, you can see that it's kind of split the difference between the white and the, the, the brown here, which is really good. Um, so if we set it right there, what we should have when we look at the RTA is we should have really good summation. Um, but we want to do this with both subwoofers, right? And we want to make sure that both subwoofers are the same. Sometimes when you have a subwoofer in a different position, it may uh, show up differently. Mm -hmm. So let me capture this one. This is the left subwoofer. Yeah. Left subwoofer phase. All right. So now go ahead and switch to the right subwoofer. Okay. So you can see that the right subwoofer needs an adjustment too to get it lined up. So go ahead and maybe adjust the phase knob again, Carlos. Cool. Okay. So he's going to match the position of the first phase knob. There's when you look at the subwoofers, there's some um, four I think positions on it where it says like zero, 90 hertz, uh, or zero, 45, 90, 90 and 135, and then uh, 180, which allows you to turn the knob. Uh, from 0 to 180 to move the phase. So that's actually really good, Carlos. Maybe yeah. could you add just a tiny bit more? Now, what's nice is the phase knob, it, it's fully variable. It's not locking you into specific degrees of phase. So you have full full access to the phase knob, not just the locked positions that, you know, Matt had mentioned we have labeled on there. So a very uh, cool feature with that as well to really get that dialed in when you're looking at a phase measurement. So I'm going to capture this one, right subwoofer phase. Okay. All right. So we should be good with that, Carlos. So um, now at this point, what we're going to want to do is uh, capture all speakers playing so we can see the result of the, the phase interaction between the speakers. So, so Rob, on you. You're muted. And you're back. All right. So what I did was I simply captured the response on the RTA. We're still zoomed in here, so it's a little hard to see. I'm going to return the uh, graph to the default scale. And then I'm going to uh, select the uh, trace that I just created, which is all speakers. And I'm going to zoom in on that using the auto scale feature. Is there a way to maybe clean that up a little bit? Yeah. So, so first I'll turn off our playing microphone. And uh, just to clarify what we're seeing, the light blue in the bottom here, or whitish color down here, that one, let me get back to it. That's one of the subwoofers. And the green trace, which is that one, is our other subwoofer. And then the white and yellow are our original main speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and start clearing these out. But what you can see is that our new trace, which is this one, 
from 60 to 100 and over 100 hertz, we have good summation all the way across. We have a, an elevation of energy all throughout the crossover region compared to the original traces when the, the subwoofer and the, mid, uh, and the main speakers weren't uh, playing at the same time. Said yeah, at 100 hertz, you can see uh, we have a good, good yeah. amount of energy here that we gained. We can use cursors to compare that. So if we set a cursor there and then select the uh, yellow trace there, we can look the difference there is 6 dB, 6.5 dB at 100 hertz. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be perceived as twice as loud. That's a yeah. big difference. And then maybe one more here. The difference there is 10 dB at 84 hertz. That's huge. So by using the phase today, we gained an additional 3 dB from what we did the previous week with just the single microphone. So last week with a micro single microphone looking at the RTA, we were able to gain about 7 dB. But with the actual phase analysis, thanks to Max, we got an extra 3 dB in that meaty section of the base, mid base uh, transition there. That's a yeah. lot. And then I'm going to move this trace down a little bit so it overlays the target a little more. Maybe somewhere right around here, I would say. Um, so what we're seeing here is we're seeing the, the null, the 60 hertz null, 59.6 uh, and 106 hertz. Uh, these two nulls are caused by the room. And with the subwoofers in the front, it may be more desirable because you have all of the energy coming from the front and you never hear anything coming from a different spot. So that's a good thing. But in this room specifically, these nulls are probably pretty, uh, pretty hard to listen to. So um, that's why we always you know, recommend measuring the room, finding out exactly what's good and what's bad. And at least if you do put it in the front of the room, if you know that it's a good position and the, it measures well, then at least you already know that before you put it there. If you just place it in the room somewhere and just hook it up, you never know what you might end up with. And uh, Tune Force free. We we recommend you download it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously with the max measurement system with the phase, you know, you can see how quickly we can further improve. But you know, for free software and a hundred hundred fifty dollar USB microphone, you can get some substantial gains in that crossover region between your subwoofer and your mains and then further dial it in with, with Max. And I you know what we did last time was Matt actually moved the subwoofer to different parts in the room or you move the microphone around. But with Max, we were able to have five different microphones in the room. So that again, expedites the, the install and tuning process. Right. And then we get that cool phase analysis as well to and make the adjustments on the phase knob and get those overlaid as best as possible with the mains. Agreed. Um, and one other thing we could probably try just for the heck of it, we could potentially try moving the center seat a little forward or a little backward and see if this, if those nulls maybe go away. Can we try that real quick, Rob? Can you mute us one more time? Yeah. So I'll mute you and you can see here, Carlos is going to move the listening location a little further forward. So we'll see the mic array kind of shift and let's uh, take a look at tune and see how that does. still hear pink noise going, but it's not too bad. It's cool. You can see how the RTA response is changing. I have my golf voice, so I don't affect the measurement. back yeah you are back so we could see that there was a level difference so what i'll do is i'll just uh adjust the level of these traces so that they're pretty close and we can kind of compare them a little easier so let's go with um and all the colors are very close to the same so i'm going to change these colors again uh so let's go with red for this one and uh let's go 
back to the other one. Let's go. And that's changing those colors by clicking, right clicking on the desired trace and selecting resave as. You don't yeah. have to change the name, but that allows us to change the color of the trace and then override the one that was previously saved into that trace folder he showed us at the start of the session. Yes, sir. Um, so now we can overlay these a little closer. So let's go um, up slightly on the, or let's let's actually get, take the forward trace down a bit. Let's bring this one down until we match most of the energy. So it's probably somewhere right around there. And then uh, the rearward trace, maybe bring that down a hair. Let's see what we got. So it looks like even with moving the seat forward and backward, we do still have some of these nulls in the area. Now, it looks like the, the forward position did slightly help yes. around the 60 hertz region. It didn't make a huge difference, but it, I mean, we gained a couple of dB at 70. So that may be desirable. So yep. if you have the ability to simply move the listening seat. And move uh, the couch a little bit. Yeah, move the couch, yep. Um, or maybe move the subwoofers forward and back. If you have a couple inches there, you can try those things. Um, and then adjust the level of the subwoofer to the, the mid base until you find something that you're happy with. And um, the last thing would be we'd want to, once you listen to it and you adjust it to taste, pop the, the microphone back into the listening position for just a minute and just capture the response yep. one more time. And then what you can do after you capture the response is you can create your own target based on this response if you're really happy with that. Yeah. And that'll help you in the future to getting closer to your uh, desired goal faster. So yeah, especially for dealers, if you guys have a curve mm -hmm. that you'd like and you want to use it all the time and you have your curve saved onto your machine already, every time you go tune, it's ready to go. It's much easier than trying to play with the EQs every time you're doing your tuning. Yep. And we posted a um, uh, help center article and a YouTube video to a previous training in the chat on how to use our targets mode in tune Four software. Um, it's always important, especially if you're connected to um, one of our DSP products, make sure you're in targets mode. Right now we're in measure only mode because we're using Tune 4 for measurements. But if you're connected to a VXI or um, MVI amplifier, just make sure you switch to targets mode or you're going to adjust the outputs of the, the DSP amplifier and not the actual target itself. And you'll know you're in targets mode. You can see on Matt's screen right now, those little panels on the bottom for your EQ, or I guess a crossovers, delay and level, all have an orange bar across the top and they say targets mode. If you were connected to one of our DSP amplifiers on the far right of the screen where you have all of your uh, individual mute icons, your master mute icon, there there's an output and target indicator as well, how you uh, switch between them and lets you know which one that you're currently on. I've done that plenty of times. I'm like, why are my outputs not changing? And it's because I was still in targets mode. <laughs> yep, for sure. Happens to uh, the best of us. <laughs> looks like uh, we had a couple comments in the chat. Um, yes, Doug mentioned that moving forward a little bit definitely helped the null. So yeah, so moving the listening position by six inches, it, it can make a big difference. And that that's even a change you could do while listening. You could sit there in the seat, you could move up a little bit, move up a little bit again and find that that magic spot where it sounds like it got better. Now, you could obviously do that with measurements, too, but you can confirm that what you heard was right by placing the mics back in the listening position and recapturing after. Um, did we have any questions come up? Um, we did have a question come in from Zach, who was asking if we could share the link for the stand. So um, yes. Max. One second. And I will Max comes with the array that all of the microphones attach to, but we don't include a tripod or an actual stand because the uses may vary. Um, so I know uh, at my house and what I keep in my car, I have a microphone stand, which I like because I can bend it as needed to contour it to a seat. Um, I know um, I've seen uh, tripods being used. Uh, it looks like Matt's bringing it up right now, actually. So That's right. And I'm going to send yeah. Rob the link so he can post it in the chat here. Perfect. So there, there's the Rob, uh, the link for Rob. So this is one we just use uh, here at JL. Um, it's uh, about $60 on Amazon. It's small enough that it fits really well into like a car, uh, a car, but it's tall enough that it can extend and be uh, full size to sit in a, a home theater 
or it could go into a boat or it could go into a pro audio, anything that you're tuning with it. It, it seems to be pretty flexible. So that's why we like it. And it's, it's cheap. So we can buy a bunch of them. Um, today we have five mic stands in here. We have all different styles, but uh, we, uh, I, I like this one a lot personally. Yes. Um, Doug, uh, going back to what we were talking about with the movements earlier, mentioned that even small movements of the sub can yield some pretty nice results. Um, even if it's staying on the front wall, just moving it a little in or a little backwards, as you were mentioning, Matt, uh, really can make a drastic impact, especially in smaller rooms. We're in a pretty massive room there. We typically can, we'll bring people in and train 40, 50 people in that room. So probably not the most ideal room for two channel <laughs> listening, but it allows us to do what we need to do for the trainings today and, and it works. But yeah, in a smaller room, those small changes can have a very drastic impact to the performance. So we had one more question here, it looks like. Yes, Tony was asking if we can, if the, can we see the same result if the subwoofers are moved the same six inches opposed to the seating area? So what we did with the the seat, uh, I think the, let's see, the one that worked better was moving it forward by 12 inches. So if I we move. The six inch one, which is what Doug was, meant, was talking about. So I did the six inch. Okay, so we moved the subwoofers forward by six inches to start. So we'll start with that and see how that goes. Rob, if you would. Yep. Yep. Oh, am I meeting you again? Yes, please. All right. So it's like they're, uh, we good? All right, you guys are back. It's so hard to not talk during that. I want to talk, but I don't want to mess up the measurements. Oh, that's all right. It's way louder <laughs> over there, so you wouldn't mess them up. Um, so now if we take this trace, which is red, it's conveniently close to that other color. I swear, whoever <laughs> selected colors in Tune software, they did it to mess with us. Um, <laughs> So if I uh, lower the uh, level of this trace slightly, so we overlay a little better, let's get the mains pretty close. So moving the subs uh, closer to the seat by six inches actually made the uh, the null worse. Now, because you're taking away the loading off the wall. Right. So what's happening there is the the subwoofer is loading off of that boundary behind it, the wall which seems to be helping the response. And as we pulled it further away, it seems to have made it worse. So in this application, moving the sub maybe isn't a, a great idea. Now it did help in the upper region here, about 106 Hertz. So it did help slightly there, but I would, I would probably say that the 60 Hertz null is yeah, it's a maybe a little bit more critical because it's, it's, uh, that's a more important area to focus on. The lower frequencies, uh, especially with the subwoofer, is uh, going to really make or break the system, I think. Being we had set phase in that stuff earlier, um, would readjusting that potentially have an impact on yeah. that? Because yeah, our because reference has changed from the listening position to where the subwoofers, the time of flight is beginning. Right. So it would uh, it would definitely slightly move that phase response. Now, moving it six inches uh, probably wouldn't move it that much because with low frequency content, it takes a lot more distance in order to shift phase uh, than high frequency stuff. So likely it wouldn't make a big difference. It may help slightly if we were to revisit that and adjust it. And that's something that you could absolutely do if you're if you're setting this up in your home and you, you should. Um, it's probably we're, we're going a little late here, so it's probably not something that we're going to keep keep doing on this today's training. But uh, what else do we have here in the chat, Rob? Um, Doug, just, you know, bringing up that, um, yeah, it definitely got better around 90 hertz. It was about a 10 dB gain, but we definitely, definitely took a hit around 60 hertz. That null definitely uh, got a little deep. Right. So us. if I, we can find out exactly what this was. So if I select that and then... Select this one. So it was, a, it was about a 4 dB at 105 hertz that we gained, roughly. 
which is good. Um, Tony, uh, you love the way we can see the result instantly. We, that we we do too. Trust <laughs> trust me. We're uh, we're very happy with it ourselves. Um, I mean, it's it's. I mean, this is all super cool. But I mean, when you get into full DSP control, it gets even cooler when you can get in and see the changes to frequency response and all of that. So um, I mean, this is what we're doing today. It's just kind of a tip of the iceberg what you can do with Max and Tune Four. And that's only because we're limited with the with controls we have. <laughs> you know, if we had this hooked up to like say to one of our car products, our VXI amplifier or MVI for our marine DSP based amplifiers, then it completely integrates in where we've got you know automated uh, EQ to target. We can set the delays. We have visibility and control for every speaker in the system that's connected through DSP. So it's a what we've done today is awesome but it's just the tip of the iceberg of what can really be done with tune four and the max measurement system. So, I mean, if you have a, a home audio uh, uh, set up with the full DSP where you can get in and actually manipulate the frequency response through uh, you know, graphic or parametric equalization, have more filter control like we have with the CR1, you can even further dial it in and improve the response based off of what tunes picking up for the measurement. So it's, uh, yeah. it is one heck of a system and, uh, it was a long wait to bring this out. I mean, I think it's about three plus years of development and uh, there's so many cool uses for it. I am always running into scenarios where like, oh, I could use it for that or I could use it for this. And it was important for us, you know, all of our trainings we've done so far um, really have been uh, built for the car audio market, but that doesn't mean Max and Tune 4 is a car audio measurement system. This is a straight up professional grade measurement system, software setup. So, you know, any types of audio you're measuring, any types of systems you're trying to improve, electrical measurements, um, we can do all of that with Max and Tune 4. And it's, it's really exciting to see all of these ideas over the years come to fruition and this awesome measurement system. And yeah, I mean, we love it, you know, we love if you use it with all of our products, but it works with any audio system in terms of measurement. And then with our car products, it, plays a little nicer thanks to that DSP integration. So, yeah, yeah. I was just going to mention on the uh, tune screen, if we had DARO, we did run it, we could probably get that 60 Hertz taken care of because it would EQ all those peaks and then we and then, can adjust level of the sub to balance that out better. So there is more adjustability that you'll have if you have additional products that can give you some EQ ability. Uh, whether through the processor or uh, the arrow in one of our subs. So, yeah, for sure. And uh, Tony, uh, I saw you haven't taken Max home yet uh, to play in the theater. But um, one other thing that we could recommend, um, which we've done here, if you get some extension rails for the Max bars, you can spread the microphones further out on a couch. Mm -hmm. You can have one in each seat position, or you could just take the mics and you know, set something so that they they're in each seat position. You can see all mm -hmm. the you know a whole couch at one time, which is really beneficial. Yeah. As long you still as you want the, the you still want the mic. center mic in the center, yeah. but all the other ones you can kind of move out and have a large sweet spot. Or if you're smug and don't care about the people around you, you can have it where it's going to sound it's it's best for you with that five mic array where your head's going to be. So that's what I would do. That's what my I wife do. doesn't know any better, so I'm, <laughs> I'm lucky in that regard. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. Well, I think that was the last thing that came in. So I think it's uh, time to call it an evening, gentlemen. All right. Sounds good. Well, then uh, thanks for everybody for, for coming to, to participate today. And thank you, Carlos, for helping out. We thank appreciate you guys for having it. me. Uh, if any problems with our session, call Carlos, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we definitely. Uh, Carlos and, uh, you know, the team in tech support, they're up for any challenges you want to throw at them. Sorry, Carlos. <laughs> yeah, Randy on the home side and then, you know, Carlos, Lee and Eric on the mobile side, any tune questions that come up, they're going to be able to get you taken care of. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, check out our help center. I know I posted some of the links in the chat today, but if you just click on the support link on the top of every single page on the JL Audio website, that takes you to our help center. Click on the tune for applications section and there's a list of articles that I'll go into further detail into some of the things we talked about today. And of course, all of our previous trainings we've done on Tune 4 and Max, you can find those under the videos tab on the JL Audio Facebook page. 
and on our YouTube channel. And we're usually about a week after the live session, it gets uploaded uh, to YouTube as we're getting through our backlog of our weekly trainings that have to be edited and then uh, uploaded there. So um, with that said, um, I think that's it. So uh, thanks everyone for watching and uh, we'll see you uh, next month <laughs> for uh, Marine May. So that'll be exciting. Right. So until next time, everyone. Thank you. Good evening, everybody.